Microsoft creation, and I've got great news for you. Joining us today in the biggest panel room that we have at Motor City Comic Con, Emmy winning, absolute star, and fan favorite, welcome to the stage, Christopher Lloyd. set of 
a clue. I mean, that was pretty early in my film life. And um, to, to work with such an incredible group of actors, you know, each, each one of them was a star in his own, or her own right. Uh, and and um, so the, and the challenge of that part was a wonderful British director, I, I don't recall his name, but it was a true ensemble. You know, it, that used to be an ideal in the, in the theater. I did a lot of theater. Uh, to get a group of people together that could do eight plays a season, and they could all find and flexible enough to find different roles, and that was, you know, and work together. And that was an ideal, an ensemble. A clue was a true ensemble. I mean, we were such a diverse group. But we love the story, we love the script. And uh, it was great. Thank you. So many iconic projects. Thank you for your question. We'll go to the other side and take your question. Mr. Hi. Um, so, my last name is Adams, and I had a decent life being a part of the Adams family. So my question to you is there, is there anything you especially liked about being part of the Adams family? Is there anything you especially liked being a part of the Adams family? Uncle Festa. Which means to rock. <laughs> I I tell you, um, when I was a kid, growing up. My family subscribed to a magazine, uh, the New Yorker magazine, which regularly had cartoons in every issue. It was very, supposed to be supposed to be very literary, you know, kind of thing, but I just grab it and flip the pages till I got it to a cartoon. And Charles Adams uh, was a contributor in each issue, weekly issue. And very often it would be a, a cartoon of Uncle Festa. And I dug Uncle Festa. <laughs> <laughs> you know, seven, eight, nine years old. And, and uh, his, his wonderful sense of mischief and kind of a evilness. And, <laughs> You know, I just enjoy it. So that, that's a phase. And then decades later, I got a phone call. Would I like to be on the festival in a movie? <laughs> Are you kidding me? <laughs> so that's what happened. So I, I love doing it. I love doing it. And working with, uh, again, you know, an extraordinary cast of uh, the other the other characters. It, it, it was loved it. It was very like a, a, a childhood dream come true. If you want to be an actor, you know, it was, yeah, so. Good, all good. You brought up Michael J. Fox's name and what Back to the Future means to him. Yes. These fans, and so many fans, anytime the two of you reunite, whether it's for a photo or something like this, people go nuts. What's it like for you when you get together with Michael J. Fox each and every time? I don't know. I just, it's, uh, it's funny because what he, when he came in to the, you know, uh, Back to the Future One, shot for six weeks, and decided that the actor who had been cast uh, for Michael, it wasn't working out. And they, they'd go on to try to get Michael uh, for the part before they even began to shoot, but he was doing family ties, I think. He was tied up. 
So they may they just decide they had to make a transition. Uh, we were working at night in a, in a market. Um, and around one o'clock in the morning, it was announced that after we ate, there was an announcement we made and we showed up and everybody. And we were told that tomorrow morning, uh, Michael J. Fox would be joining us. <laughs> and my first thought was, because I thought, I, you know, I sweated getting, even though, you know, I've, had uh, uh, a kind of childhood relationship with, with um, you know, I can't see the other The other actor? No. Uh, oh, Marty? I'm not. Oh, you uh, <laughs> oh, I'm confused. I'm thinking about one of them. No, I don't want to like that. No. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I just told my feeling was like, well, I've shot for six weeks establishing the character and getting everything just right. I don't know if I can do that. That's my feeling. You know, I have to repeat those scenes. What? But Michael and I, it, it was just, it wasn't like, oh, I'm getting to know you, going through a whole thing, you know. We just walked over the set together and we were, Doc and Marty, just like that. And it, it, that, that sense of um, mutuality, where they never left us. Today, when we get together, um, and I saw him a couple of months ago, we're Doc and Marty. <laughs> they just don't go away. And it's, it's great. He's so wonderful and, and so courageous. Strong, fabulous sense of humor. Good man. Any question? Yes. Well, first off, speaking of Clue, um, I'm one of the actors for the Dinner Detective Murder Mystery Theater. But anyway, working with what's his name, um, Howie Mandel in Walk Like a Man. The scene where you're shoving him under the water, being with Howie's OCD and him not like being touched, how did he handle that after you were like shoving his head under the water after multiple takes? You shoved Howie Mandel underwater despite the fact that he's notoriously OCD about being touched. How did Howie Mandel ha handle being touched by you? Well, he's under water, my goodness. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to remember. <laughs> Underwater in the film about he was uh, raised by wolves. Hmm? He was he was raised by wolves, and you were his brother. The movie Walk Like a Man. And walk like a man. Yeah, yeah. I told I can lie. Appreciate the honesty. We'll, we'll take another question here. Thank you. Thank you. I was told not to ask you what your favorite sandwich was. I'm not going to do that, don't worry. Um, but, you know, I appreciate all of your advancements in science, but uh, I was going to ask if there was any, like, fun shenanigans happening behind the cameras, like any sort of, like, pranks that you guys would throw on each other working on the Back to the Future films, like if there were any fun stories like that. I, well, um, what comes to mind, uh, and Back to the Future 3, there's kind of a uh, carnival, kind of a festival. It's, it's at night, and I dance with Clara, and uh, Michael's doing something with getting a pistol or whatever. But it was a lot of fun. And the band uh, that played live right there on the set, for the dance music, all that with ZZ Top. Top of the PFA, right? 
So that, that was cool. And the dancing, you know, it, 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 it was a great, real, very real party. <laughs> that was cool. Thank you for your question. Yeah. Oh, look at this. We'll go to uh, this youngster over here with a question. Uh-oh. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> Easy to pick up the tunes in Roger Rabbit? Was it easy to pick up the tunes in Roger Rabbit? Roger Rabbit. Um, well, I'll tell you, they, they had that, they wanted to work, it had to look real. When we were carrying a tune, we were actually not carrying anything, supposedly, you know, we're just, and uh, first of all, there was a guy whose name I can't remember now, he was an active comedian. And they hired him to be off camera so that when we were talking to Roger Rabbit, this guy would be there dressed up like a rabbit. <laughs> <laughs> and he was a comedian, so he could be very funny and, and a very rabbity. You know? He got a, a voice for it, that was kind of rabbity. And so we had that. That was a big help. He would, with his own personal comedy, he'd be a, a voice to a rabbit's mind. That's great, you know, because you can really focus on something that helps you. And then also they had a guy trained, a woman actually trained, um, a, a mime, a pantomist. And she, they made it, they made him rabbit, 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 a dummy, that was about that big. And it had real weight, um, I don't know, 20, 30 pounds or whatever, but it was a solid piece of tape. And so to work with, and, and she would bring up what muscles to use if you were, you know. And then they take that fake rabbit away and, and shoot it. And you would learn the movements as if you were actually holding. So uh, I guess it worked. <laughs> <laughs> Is anyone else deathly afraid of this character in Roger Rabbit? <laughs> That's the first time I ever had nightmares. <laughs> well, I I remember when I was. In my late adolescence, early teens or something, was a time when the first Walt Disney animated films came out. Snow White and Seven Dwarfs, uh, golly, this is Pinocchio, what else? Dumbo. Um, Dumbo. Bambi. Yes, Bambi. All those films, I went to every one of them when I was a kid. And there were things that I saw watching those films that kept me up sweating. <laughs> so I figured it's payback. <laughs> I want to see what in Mandalorian. Yeah. You are in the Star Wars universe now. That episode was was just very unique in its nature, and your character will make the switch. Spoilers, but uh, what was that experience like being in Star Wars? Ah, oh, I I I, I, I love my makeup. You know. Well, I, I didn't have yeah. a costume, regal and stuff, all that, all that. I I like that. In any situation, but it's such an incredible show. The technology involved, that the set, that could be come anything, anything. <coughs> the lighting, just moving a couple of walls around. Um, it's, it's 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 stunning. That, that, you know, they do it. They really do that show, and I love the part. 
I want to, I want to come back and be some more of that. segments at the beginning and end of each episode, but you did not do the voice of the animated Doc Brown. Why is that? Why didn't you do, why didn't you do the voice of the animated Doc Brown in the animated Back to the Future? That's the first I heard about. I got <laughs> and especially Emmett Brown. And so I wanted to know, like, <clears throat> how'd you develop the character, Emmett Brown, did Robert Zemeckis, and you work together, or did he give you the freedom? Because to me, you just don't read the lines. You like, you know, give a really a three-dimensional uh, character yeah. in Back to the yeah. Future. So how, how'd you develop that, yeah. that character? How did you develop the character and become the character of Emmett Brown? He said you didn't just read the lines, uh, you were the character and you lived it out and made it three-dimensional. Well, partly, for I am I'm kind of awed by physicists, <coughs> you know, scientists that deal with such complex and hard to <coughs> comprehend points, you know, they're, 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 they're like Einstein <clears throat> delved into atomic, you know, stuff and he comes up with E equals MC squared, something like that, <laughs> which, which explains everything. And other stories, I mean, some scientists I read about, he was working on it on trying to find a solution to some, some incredible mystery. And he was getting on a bus and, and putting change in the bus, and it came to him. In the same way that Doc Brown had a, a, a brainstorm about the... the uh, flux capacitor. Flux capacitor. <laughs> And he fell down, banged his head on the edge of the toilet. <laughs> you know, but that thing about discovering something that, you know, I, I know on a small scale, I'm sure everybody's, you know, you think about something that you're trying to understand, or where did I leave this, or whatever, and then phew, you have a baseball. And it all comes to you. So, I felt that that Doc was that kind of guy. He loved figuring out how things worked, not just mechanically, but in terms of what do they call quantum? Quantum physics? Quantum physics. <laughs> well, with all respect to the animated actor that voiced Doc Brown, this man was born to play Doc Brown, am I right? Yeah. <laughs> Big Bang, we appreciate that. Um, and also, were there any moments in action or in speech did you ad lib the lines or the scenes that actually made it in the film? Did you ad lib any action or words that made it into the scenes in the film? Um, I don't know. It was, it was pretty much. There was never, I don't, I don't feel any scene that I was in where they would use improvisation to come up with lines of, you know, everything was off the middle page. Might be some ex exceptions, but those who do, thanks to Bob Hale and Bob Zemeckis, their writing and collaboration, they put it together with you know, yeah. I have to, 
like that. That's a very an actor losing or forgetting their lines, their performance can, can uh, cause some interesting behavior. <laughs> I remember there was I was in a play and, and um, the, um, the soldier comes in to explain something to me. There was a long speech and we've been running and performing it for weeks. And one night he came on and he's giving me the speech. And I'm noticing he's beginning to perspire. He's like, you know, and I'm like, well, what's going on? You know, I mean, he got, we finished it all that. And I asked him afterwards, what, what was going on with what he said? I kept forgetting my next words. And I, you know, it's terrifying when that happens. Totally terrifying. Uh, and it's, it's happened to me now and then. Um, I was going to say something, but maybe it's time to. <laughs> uh, go, go, go ahead. It's a, uh, it's a cheap question to ask, but it's a cheap party trick. Would you mind giving us a great Scott to close out the mail with? Great Scott! <laughs> Yeah, give me a second. Excuse me. Get some next event. You too.